est créatrice de très peu d'emplois. Le gouvernement français a investi dans la dernière guerre en Algérie des sommes équivalentes à la totalité de l'aide accordée par les États-Unis à l'ensemble des peuples sous-développés. Ces investissements ont permis de donner du travail à 25 000 ouvriers, alors que la population active s'accroît de 60 000 personnes par an. Enfin, très souvent, les secours ont créé une situation tout à fait dramatique. Le fond, les fonds des Nations Unies pour l'enfance a secouru à peu près 50 millions d'enfants. Mais pourquoi secourir et faire vivre des enfants quand on est incapable de faire vivre les adultes qu'ils sont tenus à devenir Toutes ces questions ont soulevé tous ces problèmes, deux ordres de problèmes, un problème d'ordre moral et un problème d'ordre économique. Tout d'abord, la revendication des peuples sous-développés et la mauvaise conscience des peuples évolués qui va jusqu'au masochisme est-elle moralement justifiée Cela veut dire, est-ce que l'état de stagnation des peuples sous-développés est historiquement dû à leur exploitation par les peuples plus avancés eh bien, cette conception marxiste de l'histoire, dans sa généra généralité, est tout à fait incorrecte. Certes, il y a eu des peuples conquérants qui ont maintenu les populations subjuguées dans un état de vasselage et d'abaissement. Les Messéniens ont été réduits à la condition d'ilote par les Spartiates. Dans l'Inde, le régime des castes a résulté de vagues successives de conquérants qui ont stratifié la société pour empêcher les groupes inférieurs d'empiéter sur les supérieurs. Mais d'une façon générale, euh, le retard des peuples arriérés tient à des causes tout à fait antérieures à l'intervention de l'Occident et à ce qu'on appelait la colonisation. Ces causes, les historiens du 19e siècle les ont généralement attribuées à la race et au milieu. Ces explications sont insuffisantes. Et on peut citer quantité d'exemples. Par exemple, les populations précolombiennes de l'Amérique du Nord et de l'Amérique centrale présentaient une identité ou tout au moins une affinité raciale évidente. Et cependant, les Indiens qui ont habité les vastes plaines de l'Amérique du Nord n'ont créé aucune civilisation urbaine, alors que ceux des hauts plateaux du Mexique ou des les mayas des vallées basses du Yucatan ont édifié toute une civilisation, ont cultivé les sciences, ont une littérature. On peut invoquer l'influence géographique, l'influence du milieu, mais là encore, l'explication est insuffisante. Les vallées du Nil et de l'Euphrate ont été le berceau des civilisations égyptiennes et sumériennes. Pourquoi les populations autochtones de vallées physiquement comparables du Rio Grande et du Colorado n'ont-elles produit, produit aucune civilisation comparable Les exemples peuvent se multiplier. Certes, l'influence de la race, du milieu, des ressources naturelles n'est pas contestable, mais euh, cette influence est loin d'épuiser toutes les explications possibles. Et d'explication en explication, on en revient à rendre compte de la différence du niveau de développement par une différence de mentalité. Une mentalité s'exprime, comme l'a montré Arnold Tomby, par la façon dont réagit aux défis qui assaillent une communauté humaine. Celle-ci peut subir passivement l'impact des événements en justifiant cette passivité par un fatalisme basé, par exemple, sur un déterminisme astral, sous la soumission au décret divin, sur l'obligation d'expier en cette vie des fautes commises dans une vie antérieure. D'autres s'immobilisent dans une sorte d'intemporel. Toute innovation est condamnée au nom de la coutume des ancêtres. Ce qui caractérise l'occidental, c'est au contraire la volonté prométhéenne qui l'incite à relever sans cesse les défis de l'existence, à ne prendre parti d'aucune fatalité prétendue naturelle, d'aucune injustice réputée statutaire 
et qui lui fait considérer la condition humaine comme indéfiniment perfectible en se rendant, suivant la parole de Descartes, comme maître et possesseur de la nature par la connaissance de ses lois et par l'utilisation de ses forces. Comparons euh, à cette mentalité occidentale, celle par exemple d'Allah Facile, qui est le leader de l'istical marocain, il déclare que la civilisation introduite par la France a pu être pratique et utile, mais que les musulmans n'en ont que faire puisque leur Coran le su leur suffit. Monsieur Senghor, qui est président, comme vous le savez, de la République <coughs> du Sénégal, déclare « l'émotion est nègre comme la raison est hélène ». Or, évidemment, on ne fait pas une civilisation simplement avec de l'émotion. Il écrit également « Seul l'instinct, dédaigneusement laissé par l'Europe au primitif, peut saisir le réel qui est vérité dans sa totalité changeante, tandis que la raison discursive, la science, ne sont que des instruments ». De même, ce n'est pas la raison claire, mais l'inconscient qui constitue la trame complexe de l'être et conditionne jusqu'à l'esprit. Or, évidemment, depuis les prophètes d'Israël, de, depuis les sages de la Grèce, depuis les juristes de Rome, la preuve est faite que c'est en matant les instincts, c'est en faisant prédominer la raison sur l'émotion et la passion que l'on a pu construire une civilisation. Si l'Occident veut donc efficace, efficacement aider les peuples sous-développés, il faut convaincre leurs dirigeants de modifier leur mentalité, c'est-à-dire que pour créer des richesses, il faut d'abord créer des hommes entreprenants. Le problème est celui d'une mutation psychologique comme condition d'une promotion économique. Or, il faut remarquer, et je conclue, c'est que ce, le développement ne peut être que lent, le développement spectaculaire des pays occidentaux, qui paraît très rapide à l'échelle des siècles, a été relativement lent à l'échelle des allées. La croissance de 1 à 5,5 du revenu par tête en France de 1810 à 1952 ne correspond qu'à un taux d'accroissement de 1,2 par an. C'est l'effet cumulatif qui a permis à l'Occident de distancer l'Asie en l'espace de deux siècles et demi dans la proportion à peu près de 20 à 1. Le hiatus entre une civilisation patriarcale du type agraire et commerçant où l'existence à l'allure biblique dans les campagnes et l'allure médiévale dans les villes et une civilisation industrielle fondée sur de toute autre structure sociale ne peut pas être franchie en une génération Chercher à promouvoir la croissance économique en transférant dans le tiers-monde nos institutions démocratiques et libérales pourrait bien être l'erreur cruciale dans les troubles du Congo sans la man manifeste et dramatique manifestation. À vouloir brûler les étapes en risque la catastrophe, la route de la croissance est un chemin austère, la démocratie et la liberté ne se donnent pas. Par étapes successives, elle se conquiert. Après avoir remercié le professeur Rougier, je ne dispose plus que de cinq minutes à accorder à M. Reynonge si nous devons prendre le café à l'heure. Nous le prendrons un petit peu en retard pour entendre M. Reynaud. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, since time in a conference as that of our society is a scarce commodity, I shall not elaborate on the subject of my paper about the goal of economic development. The essence of what I have written in that paper is that we must help the underdeveloped countries to stand on their own feet. That means on one side that all aid which cannot be considered to be effective in that respect can better be left out of consideration. On the other side, that we must convince the populations of the underdeveloped countries that they can only become really independent economically and politically 
if they do themselves their utmost to increase productivity and the formation of capital. I have worked for a number of years as a banker in Suriname, one of the Guayanas lying in South America, and in that quality I have been confronted many times with the idea of my clients who wanted to set up a new kind of business, that when they could get the necessary money, they would be able to make that business a success. When I asked them if they were familiar with the technical and administrative requirements of the planned new enterprise, they had in many times to say no. But they nevertheless believed that money would solve the problems. It is in my opinion absolutely necessary to make clear to the people of the <coughs> underdeveloped countries that development requires hard work, elaborate education, willingness to bring sacrifices in the present in behalf of the better future. You will be aware that this will not sound pleasantly in the ears of the leaders and people of the countries in question, the more so because these countries are in a hurry to reach the Western standards of living considered by them to be the paradise on earth. A difficult factor is also that Russia and the other countries behind the Iron Curtain are probably more inclined to promise results at short term. Notwithstanding this, we must not be afraid to confront the underdeveloped countries with the hard facts, but at the same time we must be prepared to give economic and educational assistance in a sufficient measure and as effective as possible. The people of the underdeveloped countries are in general clever enough to realize that Russia's assistance is not purely idealistic. Only, however, when the Western countries can make true that they do not pursue other goals than the real political and economic independence of the countries to which they extend their help, there is a chance that these countries will prefer the assistance of the Western countries to that of Russia. This requires much tact and patience, but it seems to me the best policy. I thank you very much. Je remercie M. Reynaud, non seulement pour sa remarquable brièveté, mais aussi pour le contenu de ce qu'il nous a dit et qui repose sur l'autorité qu'il a acquise en dirigeant pendant huit ans la Banque de la Guyane hollandaise. Maintenant, nous allons faire le coffee break, à la suite de quoi le docteur Hunold nous fera encore une annonce et le premier orateur inscrit ensuite pour ouvrir la discussion est M. Wezeman, à qui je demande par conséquent d'arriver exactement à l'heure à 11h15. Pendant le coffee break, ceux qui désirent entendre la traduction en anglais de l'exposé de M. Förster sont priés de rester ici. strategy of the Soviets. It will not be necessary for me to say right on the outset that it, everything that is done by the Soviets is following a political aim. And in saying everything is governed by a political aim, I don't mean an aim in economic policy, but an out and down, honest to goodness, political aim. I think quite a number of mistakes are made in the Western country about the possibilities and also of the limits, and thank goodness there are limits, of the Soviet economic potential. This is due to the rather misguided thinking that there must be also in the Soviet bloc an economic sphere that is not a statist sphere, but rather private and governed by the economic laws. Well, there is no such sphere, and everything is politicized, and everything is political. Also, I would like to point out that it is at times not easy to get away from our traditional economic thinking in economic terms in order to understand this fact about the Soviet economy and Soviet economic strategy. 
but it is quite a fact that the Soviet economy is largely determined by ideology, and political ideology is a very real determinant of economic variables in the Soviet economy. In other words, the Soviet economy is not guided by economic laws, but rather by the state or almost by the religious belief in the state and the religion of statism, by ideas and taboos, and in particular by the idea that it is a historical necessity and it is inevitable in history that the era of capitalism will give way to the era of socialism. This is not my personal interpretation of fact, but it is basic to any understanding of the Soviet economy and of the Soviet economic offensive. I am at times called a defender of monopolist capitalism. Well, let me tell you that this defender of monopolist capitalism is not presenting this in his capacity as such a defender, but as a student of Soviet sources and Soviet publications. And this character of the Soviet economy is a fact which we must always keep in mind. I have quoted a number of proofs for this in my paper, which you have in writing in your folder, and I will not repeat it here. There are four points of emphasis of the Soviet offensive in the economic, in the developing countries. One is taking advantage of an anti-colonial complex. The second is a stimulation of the industrialization complex. The third is reliance on pseudo-economic trade relations. And the fourth <coughs> is to try to get into their grasp the elite, the uh, elite of tomorrow in the developing countries. The economic operations under the first point, taking advantage of an anti-colonial complex, are mainly determined by ideology. And this op these operations are quite drastic at times, but nevertheless, they are done with a good deal of technical skill. And the idea is to make the developing countries believe that only socialism is the way to give them freedom from the colonial status. There is plenty of proof of that. And they are trying to make it apparent or to make it quite plausible to the developing countries that actually the Soviet economic system is the right system for them to adopt. Because the Soviet Union is presented to them as the country that had, has managed within a few decades to move from the stage of a mainly agricultural community to the stage of that country that was the first to send out Sputniks. And this is quite a suggestive interpretation. And it is connected with the suggestion that only a political economy of the Soviet pattern is the right thing, and that only this development of the Soviet Union as a counterbalance, a political economic counterweight in the world economy has caused the Western powers to retreat from their colonial positions and to lift the colonial status of quite a number of countries. If we look at Congo or Guinea or India or Cuba, it becomes quite clear how this ideological, political, economic approach and strategy can mobilize anti-colonial <laughs> feelings in those countries. At the same time, they are trying to impress upon people in admiration and worship <coughs> of the centrally directed economy of the Soviet type. It is a fact that the financial aid of the communist bloc is much less than the aid that has been extended by the Western countries. And if we try to find out what are the causes of this striking disproportion in propaganda effect and in actual financial aid, we come to another point. It is the principle of concentration on which the Soviet economy operates and which is applied also to their offensive in the 
the developing countries. And it is sort of a modification of the old Lenin thesis of the socialist end and socialist development of the economy. Just as the economy in its own development since the 20s and up to the present seven years plan has given emphasis on certain key sectors and has alone in the first two years shifted 300 billions of rubles from the sphere of from the sphere of consumption to the sphere of industrialization with special emphasis on heavy industries in a similar way this principle of concentration is applied to the developing countries that means they concentrate the communist bloc concentrates its efforts on those countries and peoples regionally and in a selection where they, there is some tension between the local people and between the Western powers. I'd like to refer again to my paper, which says something more about it. And parallel to this effort to develop their industry without an appropriate agricultural basis or without an appropriate infrastructure, they are trying to develop and expand their trade. Now they have a monopoly, naturally the communist authorities have an, a trade monopoly with trade and exchange and prices and uh, contracts and therefore not only the Soviet Union but also the other communist countries can get at will on and off the markets of the developing countries. They can cause very real and very serious trouble to the established relationships of <coughs> other countries, as I have also illustrated. And also, they can build up a high degree of dependence in the developing countries on the continuation of their trade relations. I'd call them pseudo-economic trade relations because obviously they are not governed by anything that governs the economic process in our sense. These pseudo-economic trade relations have a double effect. For one thing, it makes the communist countries gain ground in the developing countries. Also, it troubles the West and it's rather tragic to see how the Western countries are very eager, or Western industrialists rather, how they are so very eager to do exactly what will make them lose their markets in the developing countries. That is, they are so eager to trade with the Soviet countries and supply some additional aggregates or, or some goods, which will enable the Soviet countries to fill in a tremendous overall order from the developing countries and build up some, fill, fill a big order from the developing countries and which, the, which they can fill at manipulated prices and can take away the big order as such from the Western world. Therefore, it is quite an illusion to think that East-West trade benefits both sides. Now, the economic operations of any specific country in the communist blocs are not an isolated thing. It's all a tactic, it's all part and parcel of a master plan, it's all arranged beforehand, a cooperation among the whole communist blocs and with every satellite, and it's all run by the organization which is known in our country as ComEcon the Council of Mutual Economic Relations or something. In Russian, Soviet Economists Koim Zalim Oponosci. The fourth point, uh, the effort of uh, the Soviet powers to get a grasp on the elites of the country. I want to be brief here. I only want to point out that nothing, but nothing is omitted to train the economic and technological leaders of tomorrow in the politico-economic system and dogma of the Soviet Union. And you all will appreciate of what tremendous importance this is for the economic order, the economic pattern into which the developing countries will fall in the future. Now, what the information we get, we must necessarily gather from Soviet publications. 
and I would very much advise everybody not to read them and take them at their face value. They have to be read with a good deal of caution and uh, their importance is relative rather than absolute. It is a common mistake of the West to accept them without criticism and to overrate them. Nevertheless, even with all these qualifications, what is done is of quite some importance. Here again, I have mm -hmm. given examples and uh, reported more in detail in my paper. Let me report here only about the university of the friendship among nations, where 300 to 400 students from Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Excuse me, 3,000 to 4,000. Yes, what did I say? 100. Oh, no, 3,000 to 4,000 students from Asia, Africa, and Latin America are trained in Moscow and at the expense of Moscow. And that might be a very successful move for the Soviet Union. Now, having said that, and having reported about what is being done there and what the Soviet Empire can do, I would nevertheless not like to finish on a note of pessimism. I don't intend to praise what they are doing, and I do not intend to end on a note of resignation. It just means that we must try to muster all our peaceful forces and all our forces which we have, not only in one country, but in all free countries, in order to meet this threat and meet it effectively. That is, we must not split up our efforts, but combine them. And I am quite confident that we have a considerable potential. I know from my experience in West Berlin, I have quite some experience and ab am able to see this or that or compare. I am confident that our free society has quite a lot of reserves to mobilize to meet this challenge and meet it adequately. The main thing is we must want it. Dr. Hunold has an announcement to make. Ladies and gentlemen, first I would like to inform you that David McCord Wright must leave today at noon, but for the discussion on Saturday morning on Galbraith's book, The Affluent Society, he has given at the disposal of the society a review which will be duplicated and distributed to the members. Second, uh, for the boat trip this afternoon, can't it, can we close the door there? For the boat trip this afternoon, although we have uh, the sun is shining, I would recommend uh, to take a coat with you, especially the elderly gentleman over 70, but also for the younger generation under 70, you see. Uh, third, concerning the panel tomorrow. Unfortunately, we had a meeting yesterday and we couldn't uh, do it properly. I'd asked Mr. Villiers, he has done it marvelously. But I think for the tomorrow's panel, where we have so many people uh, talking on different subjects, it would be quite good that the four chairmen and the speakers will have an assembly this afternoon on the boat. The four chairmen are Mr. Leone, Mr. Wesemann, Mr. Fertig, and Mr. Fonsickel. Mr. Leone will be the responsible for bringing these people with the speakers together on the boat in order to organize the panel tomorrow. Then I should like to tell that Mr. Van Offelen, uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Belgium, has presented a paper. This paper, uh, you can have it in the Secretariat. It has been duplicated. A third remark on uh, this panel. I have written to all the members who are, uh, have presented a paper that, if possible, only to present it orally uh, and uh, use a time uh, between 15 and 20 minutes. But you see, I can't do more. I don't like to enter into the history uh, as a sort of a commissar for freedom of speech, you see. <laughs> and uh, uh, you see, perhaps tomorrow I would like to tell the speakers 
to present just what the Frenchmen call a digest and the English call a resume. And no more. <laughs> you can see the result of the fruitful collaboration of Dr. Hunold and Professor Villiers when they were sitting next to one another that they decided to conduct an experiment with respect to the proposition about boats that Professor Villiers mentioned yesterday. We will see whether, when all of the gentlemen he suggested assemble together on the boat, whether the boat performs as Professor Villiers said. <laughs> no, Leone. Leone. No, no. <laughs> Never mind. I was, afraid. <laughs> I was speaking about the problem of the stability of the boat that he talked about yesterday. <laughs> Our time is very limited today, and I am informed by my predecessor, who had everything so well in charge that he even got, uh, got a respite for himself, that our time is very limited. Uh, Dr. Vaseman, who was, had, uh, had been scheduled to speak, has in the interest of uh, providing an opportunity for a greater number to participate, uh, very generously surrendered his time. That leaves, uh, uh, nonetheless, a, a, long, a list of enough people to take up the rest of the time without any difficulty whatsoever. The people who are now on the list, and if there are others who would like to talk, I would appreciate it if you would send up your name, are Professor Rupke, Professor Rustow, uh, Dr. Turn, Professor F uh, Fister, <coughs> Mr. Kunel Leiden, uh, Dr. Friedborg, and Dr. Heilprin. Now, in the uh, traditions of this society, it is clear that the only appropriate method to divide the time among them is to e give each a prorate a share and take off five minutes for them to sell their time back and forth. But since somehow we have not yet decided to apply this obvious and sensible liberal method to disposing of our time, I will, call, uh, I will have to resort to an older recourse of calling upon each to exercise that self-restraint which is a necessary accompaniment of a market. May I uh, call first on Professor Rutkin. Uh, Tell me frankly, how many minutes can you allot to me? Uh, <laughs> 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 One minute. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> I want to use the uh, time a lot to me uh, to make a few points. First, a very general point. The subject of undeveloped countries is a subject uh, which, of course, may be very exciting and attractive for the uh, economic, for the specialists in economics. But we cannot rival with the American Economic Association or Royal Economic Society or any other of those learned uh, societies of uh, economists. It is our great advantage that um, <clears throat> here the Montpellier Society uh, gives an opportunity uh, of um, <clears throat> discussing such a subject not only from this angle of economics, but from the other angle, which are just as important or even more important. If there is a subject which needs such a synthetic uh, treatment, it is this. We have to think of the political aspect, the psychological aspect, sociological aspect, and even legal aspect, and so on and so forth. Second point, <clears throat> I want to stress that the recent experiences show, I think, uh, to the most obstinate optimist uh, that uh, the way in which we help the West help the undeveloped countries is must be thoroughly wrong in the average. The most recent example, I think, is the most convincing one, the example of the American aid in Laos. And I only want to recommend to you to read, and particularly I want to recommend to uh, my uh, uh, American friends, uh, an article 
which has been written by Ferriol in the last number of the Revue de Paris, Les Américains au Lard. There you learn that the Americans have spent $250 million in Laos, this very small country, in order to set up an army, I think, of, of 30,000 men. The end, final result, the whole one billion marks, day marks or Swiss francs has gone down the drain. And what the Americans get is anti-American propaganda from the radio in Vientiane. So something must be thoroughly wrong with this whole uh, method. And it is really no time is to be lost in order to study uh, this uh, uh, problem. And now the most important point I have to make of this. I mentioned that we have to look at the different angles of this problem. Uh, let me study one which I think is the most important one. How to situate, as the French say, how to situate this problem of undeveloped countries in most general terms. I think one way to understand this phenomenon is to say that today we have the exciting spectacle of so many nations not belonging to the occidental orbit, the orbit of occidental civilization, to become occidentalized. I avoid the term Europeanized in order not to offend our American friends. <laughs> but in the most general sense, of course, it can be said that Europe now has become the mother house of a world civilization with the United States, <coughs> played the role, let's say, of Magna Grecia in the ancient world, people in New York feeling like those in Syracuse or Marsilia. And if they remember what Syracuse was in the ancient world, I think they cannot be offended by this comparison. But that is an altogether different story. We should deal with this perhaps at another occasion. We should perhaps next year discuss this problem of the coming world civilization. And now <coughs> we see that on the margin of this world civilization, exactly on the margin, are the undeveloped countries of today. And that's the difference of these new undeveloped countries from the undeveloped countries of the past, among which all countries have been. Of course, Switzerland has been, Germany has been undeveloped countries, and more recently, Canada or the United States, and so on. But now, this drive for occidentalization in those countries is a rather peculiar aspiration. What they first of all want are the material results of the occidental civilization. Our machine, uh, our cement factories, our internal combustion engines and all that sort of thing. And they believe that they can take part in this world economy and world civilization uh, without also uh, assimilating themselves uh, to the infrastructure, I think that's the right word now, the infrastructure, the moral <coughs> intellectual infrastructure of, uh, of our cement factories. And um, there we have to remember that the world economy of the Occidental world, uh, of course for the economists, was based on the theory of comparative cost, but uh, in the last resort is what based on uh, the uh, most elementary principle of the international law, which is pacta Sunt servanda. Pacts have to be kept, and we should add now, and property 
has to be respected. Now, the remarkable thing is that in the Occidental world, properly speaking, we still have, in spite of all weakening of this, we still have a solid remnant uh, of this infrastructure. Uh, uh, Example, Belgium. Uh, <coughs> Belgium, as long as Belgium uh, was the uh, power administrator of the Congo, the Swiss capitalists have lent to the Belgian Congo, Congo at 4%. Uh, now, uh, we still go on lending Belgium at 4%. Of course, we don't doubt that the Belgian government will live up to its obligation. But there is no rate of interest conceivable at all, at which someone in his senses would lend a penny to Lubumba. And, <clears throat> of course, the same is true of Castro, and the same is true of the Nassas and Sukarnos of, uh, of, of the present, present world. And the situation is this, that these new undeveloped countries may, with their so deficient intellectual moral infrastructure, uh, still play or still take part in the world economy as far as it is an uh, exchange of goods. But they cannot take part without this infrastructure in that part of the world economy which is the most sensitive, the most nervous part of the world economy. And that is where two risks which are themselves already very high combine. The risk of international trade is already great because you have no world, world state, you have to rely on all the uncertainties of international life. And the other risk is, of course, giving your money to, uh, to, foreign, to foreign people uh, whom you don't know from Adam. If those uh, risks, of course, are combined, then uh, we are not surprised that here we reach the most neuralgic point of the world economy. And of course, that cannot be expected to, to work at all uh, without this minimum of this infrastructure of which I spoke. So the fact, the fact stands out uh, very largely and, and, and eminently that the problem of the undeveloped countries today is essentially this that while on the one hand they won so eagerly uh, to reach the material result of Occidental civilization, they have not yet grasped. That, uh, that is only the superstructure, and they have to learn that the uh, infrastructure is the very basis of this, and they need this for getting that factor, forgetting that, for fulfilling that, that uh, uh, prime requisite uh, for development, which is, which is kept. That is everything I want to say. Thank you. We are very grateful to Professor Rufke for his illuminating comments, and I call now on Professor Rustow. Meine Damen und Herren, ich kann unmittelbar an die Ausführungen meines Freundes Rufke anknüpfen. Wir alle sind uns darüber einig, dass die einzig vernünftige und die einzig sympathische Art der Kapitalhilfe an die unterentwickelten Länder die normale private Investition ist. Diese Möglichkeit äh, hat einen denkbar schweren Stoß erhalten durch die brutale, äh, totalitäre Manier, in der Castro jetzt diese Enteignung durchgeführt hat, wobei er zu dem Schaden ja auch noch den Hohn und den Spott hinzugefügt hat. So werden es auch viele andere äh, unterentwickelte Länder, die auf solche Investitionen gerechnet hatten, empfinden, den Schaden, den ihnen Castro zugefügt hat. 
Sie scheinen aber bisher das Gefühl zu haben, Sie können nichts dagegen tun. Ich glaube ja, dass wir etwas dagegen tun können. Und zwar, wenn die äh, unterentwickelten Länder, die entschlossen sind, ihre Verträge zu halten und auf dieser Basis äh, ausländisches Privatkapital zu bekommen, einen Club der anständigen und zuverlässigen Länder gründen würden, die sich gegenseitig verpflichten zur Einhaltung dieser elementaren Regeln. Die müssten äh, paraphiert werden und es müsste durch internationale Verträge diese Staaten sich gegenseitig zur Einhaltung dieser Regeln verpflichten. Äh, selbstverständlich äh, würde hinter dieser Verpflichtung keine militärische Sanktion stehen, aber eine sehr wirksame moralische Sanktion, wenn nämlich die Aufnahme in diesen Club der Anständigen und Vertrauenswürdigen streng gehandhabt werden würde. Und wenn außerdem jedes Mitglied, was gegen diese vertraglich eingegangenen Regeln verstoßen wird, ausgestoßen wird aus diesem Club, so könnte das die allerstärkste praktische Wirkung haben. Denn es ist klar, dass die Angehörigen dieses Clubs der Vertrauenswürdigen sehr viel leichter als haben wird, auch das Kapital privat zu bekommen und zu sehr viel besseren Bedingungen. Das heißt, der Unterschied zwischen den Angehörigen des Clubs und den Nichtangehörigen könnte sich direkt in zahlenmäßig in der Höhe der Prozentsätze, die man zahlen muss, ausdrücken. Das könnte eine sehr wirksame und sehr konkrete Sache sein und hätte außerdem noch den großen Vorteil, dass es eine genossenschaftliche Selbsthilfe der Länder selber wäre. Dazu brauchen sie uns nicht. Im Gegenteil, wir müssten uns ja ganz aushalten dabei. Nicht wahr? Das ist ein konkreter Vorschlag. Und wenn ich noch etwas hinzufügen darf, obwohl ich damit meine Aussicht auf eine olympische Medaille für den Rekord der Kürze in Frage stelle, <lacht> äh, wer die, äh, äh, die Bedeutung dieses Problemkreises, den wir hier erörtern, ist so brennend und die öffentliche Verwirrung der Begriffe darüber ist so groß. Die Konvergenz aller Ausführungen, die hier gemacht worden, ist so evident, dass ich vorschlagen möchte, dass wir die Papers, die hier über dieses Thema vorgelegt worden sind, drucken lassen, erscheinen lassen im Druck, und zwar möglichst Englisch eine Ausgabe, eine französische Ausgabe, eine deutsche Ausgabe. Ich glaube, damit würde die Montpellier Society eine sehr wichtige öffentliche Aufgabe erfüllen. Über die Details, es sind schon gewisse Dinge im Gange, nicht mehr, an die man anschließen könnte, das gehört hier nicht vor das Plenum, aber ich möchte den Vorschlag machen. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to follow up the comments that have been made by my friend and colleague, Professor Röpke. I really think what he has been pointed out is the only sensible and reasonable approach, the only sensible and reasonable way for developing countries to get capital is normal private investment. Now this process of normal private investment in developing countries has been hard hit by the brutal and totalitarian methods of Herr Castro in expropriating foreign property. And in doing that, he has also added insult to injury. I think there may be quite a number of developing countries who feel that their chances have also been hurt and they themselves have been rather impaired in their prospects by what Castro has been doing. But at present, they seem to feel there is nothing they can be done about it. Now, I would, to, would like to submit that there is something that can be done about it. And I would submit that those developing countries that want to keep their treaties and want to keep the rules of the game and want to get capital on that basis of reliability, they should form a club, set up a club of decent borrowers that, uh, and they, members of the club should undertake to stick to the rules of the game and to keep the elementary rules on the basis of which they can get capital. And this should be done by way of an international agreement. Naturally, adherence to the agreement would not be ensured by military sanction, but there could be strong moral sanction. For instance, the club of the decent could make rather stiff rules for qualification for admission, 
Also, any offender should be excluded from membership, and I think that would have quite a considerable practical effort. It would also show in the prospects of members of the club because they would find it a lot easier to get foreign capital and they would generally be in a much better situation. And the difference in the status of the members of the club of the decent countries and the others could even be expressed in percent and would become quite obvious. It should therefore, another advantage is that this will something be something like a cooperative effort of the developing <coughs> countries themselves, the capital, the lending countries, the capital providing countries could keep out of it. It would be something like a self-help organization of those countries who want to borrow. I want to add another idea, although I'm afraid it sorely impairs my chances of getting an Olympic gold medal of putting, expressing myself briefly, I think the importance of what has been said on the subject of developing countries this morning is so considerable and there is such a confusion in the general discussion about assistance to economic development. Also, there has been such a high degree of convergence of everything that has been pointed out by the speakers this morning that I would submit that all the papers on this subject should be printed and published. And there should be an English edition, a French edition, and a German edition. And I think in sponsoring this, the Mont Pelerin Society would perform a considerable public duty and public task. Details, some details are already underway. I, this is not a subject for the plenary mission. But I think uh, this idea can very well be followed up, and this is what I beg to submit to the audience. The uh, first Ruska may not win a gold medal. Those are, of course, reserved in, in this uh, room for the Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> but we shall see whether, but, but he came very close, I think, to qualifying, and especially uh, in view of the necessity for translation. I call on Dr. Turn. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, before I make a short statement, I'd like to introduce myself. I am not a student or a scholar. I uh, um, uh, have been uh, assigned uh, a few years ago to the uh, board of the World Bank, uh, and that got me into the uh, development loan and into the foreign aid business. And since then, I've been with the Austin Treasury as counselor. And as you know, uh, no country is uh, nowadays too small and too poor as not to be confronted with uh, the needs and expectations of the underdeveloped countries. So the Treasury is as good a place as any other to uh, follow developments and uh, trends in that field, as with conditions created by the rulers of these countries, uh, <coughs> financial assistance is really only possible either mm -hmm. through uh, direct appropriations from the national budgets or at least through guarantees of the state. Uh, I think there are two facets of this issue which command our interest. One is the growing involvement, involvement of Europe in the foreign aid, and the other are the differences between uh, foreign aid practices, theories and practices in Europe and in America. The first uh, uh, question, the growing involvement of Europe in foreign aid. I should say till about five years ago, uh, foreign aid was considered an exclusively uh, North American, United States domain. Even Canada was at first reluctant to join in. But then the time came when it was realized that the resources of the U.S. were uh, insufficient for, uh, as related to the so-called needs of these countries. And it was, one became aware of the uh, negative effects of uh, bilateral aid arrangements on foreign relations. Well, the consequence was that a lot of the American aid was channeled through the international organizations. That was one thing. And then that uh, pressure, or let us say urge, 
was exercised on European countries to join in. Well, these efforts were entirely successful. I should say growing amounts of European money are now flowing into the coffers of the governments of the underdeveloped uh, countries. Now, what are the motivations in the US and what are the motivations here? I think the motivations in the US have been very ably exposed by Mr. Bauer. It's a general idea that government-to-government uh, -government loans are going to increase the standard of living and that better housing and better food is going to uh, uh, change people's attitudes, that they're going to be less aggressive and more uh, peaceful and more resistant to totalitarian temptations. Now, I think this idea has been proved by events to be fallacious, but yet it has lost little of its appeal. Now, the European side, as I see it in Europe, one believes less in the virtues and benefits of environment conditioning. Well, this has an important consequence, you see, as uh, an improvement of uh, living conditions is perhaps not a primary uh, objective of European foreign aid policies, as this is not the case, then not, no or less conditions are imposed. Less conditions assuring a, a rational uh, distribution, a rational use of foreign aid. And this dispensing of conditions is considered, as I hear it, as a kind of improvement on American foreign aid practices. The result, will, of course, will be that uh, European uh, aid money will tend to be used still more than American aid money for uh, concentration of power, for political ends in the recipient countries. But this doesn't really deter, because there are some people who have held a somewhat cynical opinion that if the underdeveloped countries want a, a system providing for the concentration of power, well, let's give it to them if we want their friendship, if we want close ties with them. This is uh, <coughs> what one hears. If, they, if this concentration of power is used for the oppression of uh, uh, the nationals of these countries, well, that, that isn't our business. Now, just quickly, the arguments used in Europe, let's say the low-level arguments for foreign aid. One is, if we don't do it, the Russians are going to do it. All right. Well, very few people realize that uh, uh, the, the, the far, far, foreign aid, uh, or let us say, the effects of uh, the Russian aid to the underdeveloped countries are not uh, compensated by uh, Western aid, of the uh, present variety of government-to-government -government loans, but they are rather compounded. Well, this is one argument. The other argument, also a low-level argument, I would say, is uh, that these countries need uh, European finance, Western financed uh, comprehensive development plans to break through the vicious circle of poverty. I mean, all this has been very well presented and exposed by Professor Bauer. Now, uh, the, the, as a third, there's a fascination, uh, comprehensive development plans and uh, nationalization exerts on uh, uh, people of certain persuasion in Europe. But I wouldn't be concerned with that either, you see. What I'm concerned with are the arguments used by conservatives and liberals in Europe to promote uh, uh, foreign aid. Because we must uh, uh, be clear on one point, I mean, the inspirers, the promoters, the executors of foreign aid programs in Europe are not the socialists, but are more the conservatives, the liberal side. Now, there are four arguments. I'm not going to deal with them. I'm just going to mention them, which I hear in my vicinity. One is the channeling of pressures for the expansion of markets into a direction where it is less dangerous, politically dangerous. Vested interests see potential markets in the armed curtain countries. They press on governments to develop, to open these markets. If the government can say that, no, there is a market in Southeast Asia, we are going to provide the financing, we are going to provide the purchasing power in these countries through government loans. Go and try there, you see. This is a, a, an answer to that. The other, point, the other uh, 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 argument used is a, it's a liberal argument, international capital movements. Uh, 
we have received a lot of capital from abroad, let's give some capital to these countries. Uh, the third argument is status. Status seekers we heard about yesterday. Well, it's not only individuals, it's governments who seek status. And status used to be sought and found in uh, very many famous streets in our old European capitals. But now status is in, uh, in, in Washington, 8th Street, in the 1800s, where the Britain would institute sit. And at these big conferences, a government representative a representative of a government who's done a lot for foreign aid has got much more status than a representative of a government who's done nothing for that purpose. And the final argument which is used from the conservative side, that is the repayment of a moral debt to the US. Now you will all doubt that such a thing exists, I mean the consciousness of a moral debt, but it is. All the uh, countries have received money, and if you ask me, for instance, what a government in Europe can do to give real pleasure to the U.S. State Department, my answer would be give the Indians some money, give the Burmese some money. It creates, it, it creates satisfaction. Well, I can't deal with these four arguments. I can just only mention them. All the rest, I think, I, of my um, statement, I think I will suppress, although there are other very important points which could be dealt with. But I'll just say one thing. I mean, a lot of you may be tired with this business of the underdeveloped countries and say for five years we've been hearing about this and we're just pretty well fed up. Well, my feeling is that we're only at the beginning of it. Thank you. I thank uh, Dr. Turn for his... Uh, uh, very interesting comments on a topic that I should prefer to call the problem of foreign subsidies, since if I understand the tenor of the discussion to this point in this meeting, it is that the most effective foreign aid we could render would be to eliminate foreign subsidies. The, uh, may I uh, offer the floor to Professor Fister? Meine Damen und Herren, wenn in fünf oder sechs Jahren der Aswan-Damm 110 Meter hoch, anderthalb Kilometer breit, fertig ist, dann steht dort ein Denkmal des Kommunismus. Und aus Afrika und Asien werden sehr viele dorthin fahren und die Reisen werden auch bezahlt werden von Moskau. Wer würde nicht wünschen, wer der Anwesenden würde nicht wünschen, dass dieses Denkmal, das der Aswan darstellt dann, mit auch wirtschaftlichem Effekt, von westlicher Seite gebaut wäre. Die Weltbank stand in Verhandlungen, ehe der Aswan-Damm von Russland finanziert wurde. Und die Weltbank hat eine kleine Broschüre darüber veröffentlicht, über diese Verhandlungen. Und gestatten Sie, dass ich die beiden entscheidenden Punkte hervorhebe. Die Weltbank verlangte von NASA Garantien dafür, dass die Millionen Dollars, die von der Weltbank zur Finanzierung des Aswan-Dams gegeben werden, auch für den Aswan-Dam wirklich ausgegeben werden, nicht in irgendwelchen orientalischen Kanälen verschwinden. NASA lehnte diese Forderung der Weltbank ab mit dem Hinweis, das ist Eingriff in die ägyptische Souveränität. Die Weltbank forderte zweitens, dass Maßnahmen getroffen werden von der ägyptischen Regierung, dass durch das Einströmen von Hunderten von Dollar, von Millionen, Hunderte von mehreren Hundert Millionen Dollar, nicht inflationistische Effekte im ägyptischen Preisniveau hervorgerufen werden. Nasser lehnte das ab und sagte, das ist typischer Kolonialismus, wenn solche Überlegungen von der Weltbank gefordert oder angestellt werden und Forderungen gegenüber Ägypten äh, gemacht werden. Ich erzähle das bloß, um Ihnen die unerhörten Schwierigkeiten zu zeichnen und darauf aufmerksam zu machen, dass wir nicht in den Fehler verfallen, zu sagen, die Russen sind nur hier als Wirtschaftler tätig. Jede russische Wirtschaftskommission ist gleichzeitig eine halbe Militärkommission und ist auch eine politische Kommission. Und jeder Stützpunkt der Russen außerhalb des Eich, der eigenen Grenzen in den unterentwickelten Ländern bedeutet einen politischen Stützpunkt des Kommunismus. 
Und darin sehe ich den unerhörten Ernst dieser ganzen Problematik. Die, Welt, die Anleihen der Weltbank sind mit 95% kaufmännisch, mit 5% politisch. Die Anleihen Russlands sind 95% politisch und 5% kaufmännisch. Und das ist eines der, eine der großen Schwierigkeiten, vor deren wir stehen und wo wir die auch nicht verschließen dürfen. Zweites Beispiel. Vor einem Jahr schrieb der Präsident der Indischen Republik Prasad Anero einen Brief, der leider in Europa ziemlich untergegangen ist, des Inhaltes. Er warnt vor der weiteren Industrialisierung Indiens, wenn und soweit die Landwirtschaft vernachlässigt wird. Und es ist ein großer Fehler von allen, welche Indien unterstützen, wenn sie nicht gleichzeitig fordern, wenn wir schon Geld geben, dann soll die Hälfte mindestens in den Sektor gehen, der am wichtigsten ist zur, Hebung, zur Behebung des Hungers, Richtung Landwirtschaft. Heute ist man in Indien so weit, dass man es einsieht, die Vernachlässigung der Landwirtschaft, die Bevorzugung der Industrie, der Großindustrie vor allem, ist nicht, führt nur zur Steigerung der Ungleichgewichtigkeit der indischen Wirtschaft im Ganzen. Und ich darf aus einer deutschen Zeitung vom Dienstag dieser Woche etwas wiederholen, was bloß die Besorgnisse aller, die diese Probleme etwas äh, studiert haben, bestätigt. Ruhr Kehlat, das Hochhofenwerk, das von deutscher Seite auch aufgebaut worden ist, arbeitet nur mit zwei Hochhöfen. Der dritte ist nicht angeblasen, wird auch nicht angeblasen vorläufig. Warum? Weil für das produzierte Eisen und den Stahl, der von den zwei Hochhöfen geliefert wird, kein Absatz da ist in Indien. Absatzschwierigkeiten, das gleiche gilt auch für das russische Hochofenwerk, das auch bloß mit zwei Öfen arbeitet. Absatzschwierigkeiten, die Produktion ist angelaufen, aber der Markt ist nicht da. Das wird sich wieder einpendeln, aber immerhin doch ein bezeichnendes Beispiel für die Schwierigkeiten, die hier vorhanden sind. Drittes Beispiel. Der, einer der besten deutschen landwirtschaftlichen Sachverständigen, Professor Schiller, der Russland sehr gut auch kennt, war von der Regierung in Pakistan seine Gutachten aufgerufen, eingeladen worden. Er sollte einen Rat geben, Entwicklung der Landwirtschaft in Pakistan. Der kurze Rat von Professor Schiller war, schafft bäuerliches Privateigentum in Pakistan. Dieser Rat, schafft bäuerliches Privateigentum in Pakistan, geht natürlich gegen eine tausendjährige Tradition in Pakistan an. Und hier liegen wiederum die ganz ungeheuren wirtschaftlichen Probleme. Europäisch-amerikanische Wirtschaftsvorstellungen stoßen auf die ältesten Traditionen und werden abgelehnt. <lacht> Letzter Punkt. Das, die welches sind die Mittel und wie können wir das Arbeitsethos in diesen Ländern entwickeln, wenn wir hören, dass kürzlich die indische Regierung eine Verordnung erlassen muss, musste, dass die indischen Beamten mindestens an 150 Tagen im Jahre Arbeit. Hier stoßt eben Arbeitsethos, Arbeitseffizienz und Arbeitstätigkeit und Tüchtigkeit von Jahrhunderten und Jahrtausenden grundsätzlich mit aufeinander. Der Rat, der zu geben ist für alle, die in diesen Dingen äh, tätig sind, lautet meiner Ansicht nach, und da treffe ich mich auf Arne mit Herrn Röpke und mit Herrn Rüst und all den anderen, die heute Vormittag gesprochen haben, Schutz des Privateigentums. Aber muss nicht dafür gesorgt werden, dass das schlechte Beispiel, wie in Europa zum Beispiel mit Privateigentum verfahren ist, verfahren worden ist und verfahren wird, dass das nicht draußen nachgeahmt wird. Wer hat es denn mit vorgemacht, dass das Privateigentum nicht sonderlich hochgestellt wird? Die Rechtssicherheit, langsames Spielraum schaffen von Spielraum für Wettbewerb und Ausbildung oder Steigerung des Arbeitsethos. Dankeschön. I wonder if Mrs. Grosser-Schwara could uh, uh, provide us with a very brief translation. The situation is such that the longer the, t the talk in German, the shorter must be the translation in English. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if in five or six years the Aswan Dam stands, it will be a monument to communism. No doubt many pilgrims from Africa and Asia will go there and be paid by Moscow. Then naturally we shall wish that this had been done, the Aswan Dam had been built by the West. 
We have on hand a report of the World Bank paper about its negotiations with NASA about financing the other one then, that was before the Soviets stepped in. Two important points. The bank asked NASA to guarantee that the millions of dollars put up by it to finance the Aswan Dam were actually used to finance the Aswan Dam and were not disappearing in uncontrollable channels. NASA said no, that's an interference with our national sovereignty. Secondly, the bank demanded that measures be taken, that this tremendous investment did not result in local inflation. NASA said no, that's colonialism. I repeat that just to say how tremendously difficult the task in the developing country is, and that one should not make that mi the mistake that the Soviets are just pursuing an economic aim, because any Soviet economic mission is also a political mission, and any economic base <coughs> of the Soviets is a base of communism. Bank, the international bank is 95% commercial, 5% political, the Soviets is the other way around. I want to give a few interesting examples. A year ago, the president of India wrote to Nero warning against further industrialization <coughs> at the neglect of the agriculture, which is, after all, important to fight starvation. I think the Western countries that give India money should insist <coughs> that at least one half of it should be used for agriculture. Second, a German paper reports that at the Rukela Steelworks in India, that was uh, established by uh, Germans, only two of the smelting furnaces are in operation. The second isn't going to be put into operation because there is no market for the steel. They, they have an overproduction already. That will even out eventually, but not so soon. Third, Professor Schiller, well-known agriculturist, was asked for advice by the Pakistan government, and he said, Give the, give the peasants or the tenants farming property. This sounds terrific for a country where for thousands of years the tradition has been the other way around, the big, big landowners and not, not no farming properties. Next point, working morale. To illustrate this, Indian government recently gave an order would civil servants please work at least 150 days a year? This again illustrates that the situation and traditions and feelings in developing countries very often do not coincide at all with our own. I quite agree with what uh, Monsieur Röpke and Rusto and all the other speakers said this morning. It's important to protect private property, but then I'm afraid Europe gave not a too good example in respecting private property. It's important to see that there are all sorts of legal safeguards that are required. It is important that there should be a proper training, and it's important that there should be a boost to working morale. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Kunold Leiden has it. I think I should give you collectively a few points about the underdeveloped countries, and the reason why I take the courage to mention them at all is the fact that every year, for several years now, I'm making a trip around the world and visiting the underdeveloped countries myself. I want to raise the following just points, point after point. First of all, we must decide whether the underdeveloped countries have a right, whether they have a rightful demand on our aid, or whether this is a matter of charity, or number three, of political wisdom. And I think a right and a demand should never be accepted, and of course it is merely a matter of charity, number one, and of a political wisdom under the present circumstances. But on the other hand, we should never lose sight of the fact that we are here in a colossal blackmail game. I remember only a few months ago, I saw in Stanleyville, in the Belgian Congo, uh, a, a sort of pamphlet, uh, a, 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 a sort of paper printed in French, and uh, with several points of attacks against the Belgians, saying we should never be afraid to lose the Belgians, lose the Belgian money, because uh, Moscow and Washington is going to provide us with every imaginable sum. 
In other words, there's an enormous blackmail game. Number three, we are already fully in the development of a neocolonialism. Now, this word neocolonialism has been used by the left as a critique and an attack. But the fact is that we are in a competitive neocolonialism, that it is absolutely evident that the new so-called independent nations cannot stand on their feet, that they do need, demand our aid, whether they really need it is another question, demand our aid. And due to the circumstances, we are forced to give them our aid, to send our experts there, and a neo-colonial situation exists. In this connection, I would say especially to my American friends, I'm an Austrian, my country never had a colony. I say unfortunately so, but talking about the other colonialist powers... Switzerland, you mean? No, no, no. <laughs> it was the other way. It was the other way around. We were ruled by the Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> and Nemo Propheta and Patria is, of course, the explanation of the further development. <laughs> there is no reason for any European nation who has been a colonial power to be particularly ashamed of the role. Because the good done, especially for the colonized nations, was infinitely greater than the inevitable, of course, shortcomings, mistakes, brutalities, which did happen. We have to strike here an honest balance. The other, the other thing Americans should never forget, either that the overseas areas were, was our west, was our frontier, our modern European cities are, not in Europe, but in Africa and Asia. This was the, here was a place where European energy could develop. We have to ask ourselves a small question, to what extent the lack of colonies, that means the possibility for dynamic and aggressive people to expand themselves, has led, for instance, to National Socialism in Germany. And it is quite natural, I would not say that the higher and the lower civilization, but that a dynamic civilization inevitably will encroach on a static one. Of course, the enormous element there is envy. It is absolutely clear to me as a visitor of these countries that our civilization, based on rationality, on logic, on discussion, could only develop in the shadow of the cross, in a narrow sense of the term, in a wider sense of the term, in the, under the impact of the Judeo-Christian Hellenic civilization. And we do not find overseas logic, objectivity, and rationality as we are used to them. I could tell you endless little stories, have to cut them out. But as we own these characteristics, the others do not have them. Out of Satori, out of Zen Buddhism, you cannot make an IBM machinery. This is the privilege of the Western civilization. We must always distinguish two types of, of, col uh, of overseas areas, those where we have primitives and those where we had elder brothers, old and ancient civilization, which we have radically overtaken and which view us with mixed feelings but of another type as the primitives, roughly Asia and Africa. And of course now, if we ever enter into these areas, we must deal with these nations with both, with tact and firmness, with authority and affection. One of the great claims in the Congo of the loaded population against the Belgian was always this, ils ne sont pas gentils avec nous. But ils ne sont pas gentils avec nous means that the Belgians did not fall around their necks. And this is what they very often want. The Belgians, if the Belgians had provided not a single school, not a single hospital, not a single modern installment, and just had fallen around their necks and taken many, many black mistresses, of course, the, the Congo would be solidly pro-Belgian today. <laughs> so in other words, we are living there in an emotional world and not in the world of reason and logic and gratitude and give and take and so on. Government by law, these are concepts we should not expect overseas. This is only possible after a long, long development. And of course, what one sees in general, if you take a general view, you see the enormous, the gigantic harm done by the uninformed moralists, the do-gooders, unfortunately so many of them in the United States. Of course, I never forget Ne parlons pas des Américains, ne disons pas les Américains, il n'y a que des Américains. And on the other hand, the well-informed immoralists, 
not to do goodness, but to do ev evilers in, in Russia. Western society ought to show, especially towards the overseas areas, at least a minimum of solidarity. And uh, after having visited the Congo at the beginning of this year here, talking to the Belgians there, who found themselves in a situation without issue. The Belgians had a marvelous program of education. A place like Lovanium, the university near Leopoldville, where I also lectured, uh, we have no such place on the European continent, at least as to size. University buildings in the length of eight kilometers or five miles. And what do we get in the Western press? What we get in the Western press is perfectly nauseating. The Belgians knew very well that if they continue to hold down the Congolese, which theoretically they should have done in the interest of the Congolese, in the interest of all of our values, the rest of the Western world would have jumped at their throats and would have left them in the lurch just as they have left them in the lurch now. The Western press, there is no doubt to my mind, has behaved towards our fellow Belgians like swine. Thank you so much. Dr. Fredberg. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it has been simply fascinating to follow the discussions, hear the speeches here as a guest. But at the risk of not becoming invited again to the Mont Pelerin Society, I have to offer a humble opinion that far too much stress has been put on economy and far too little on the political factors. Economy is important but the underlying factors are often political. And they are, if not ignored, so not treated with the same seriousness as the economical factors. This applies to the underdeveloped countries as well. I agree with very much with Mr. Kuno Ledin. I have also the occasion to visit the underdeveloped countries rather thoroughly every year. But I find very seldom anyone seriously interested in examination of nationalism of the underdeveloped countries. The nationalism of the underdeveloped countries is an, not an entirely political problem, but overwhelmingly political. I think the time is ripe for a thorough examination of the nationalism not only of Messrs, Lumumba, Castro, and Socarno, but also of all the others. And we have a special reasons, we Europeans, because we once produced that nationalism, which has been exported to the underdeveloped countries and misused there. There is another reason for us to take an interest in the nationalism of the, the underdeveloped countries, and that is the Jews, the Russians, make of them. But you know, even the Russians cannot use that nationalism entirely freely. It is astonishing that the Russians have not been able since 1917 to do more damage on this than they actually have. If we think back and we think about their support of the Turkish nationalist movement of 1920 and on Mustafa Kemal, and all the hopes Moscow had that Kemal would be the man of communism in Turkey. Kemal, as you know, hanged the communists. And he was not alone in this rather primitive, ruthless, but very efficient action against the communists. It was a day, seven years later, in 1927, when Stalin just has, had written an article praising the young nationalistic friend of Russia, Chiang Kai-shek. And that article had to be taken out of the printing machines because they had just got the message from Shanghai that Chiang had turned against the communists. Now there are more examples and 
we are by no means helpless on this field. The Russians are threatened themselves by nationalism. <coughs> the Russians have, as you know, colonies which have only one advantage compared with the European and other colonies. They happen to have a common frontier with their motherland, with Russia. But one day the Russians will have nationalism in their Asiatic and part also of their European parts. I'm not speaking about all the nations they have subdued. There it is quite natural, quite obvious. We need only to think about Poland and Hungary. Even the Chinese are threatened by nationalism. If one witnesses, for instance, the treatment of the Chinese in Indonesia, in a country which has often been used as example of a country with the worst, exam with the worst possible administration existing on earth, a rich country which refuses to die because of its richness in spite of the strenuous efforts of the government to kill it. In that country, Chinese are treated like vermin, to quote the late Naren Bevan. <clears throat> and China has to put up with it. And the Chinese have found no argument and the Chinese are absolutely helpless against the mere fact that the Indonesians believe that they can get away with it. And they go on dealing with the local Chinese consuls, with the Chinese refugees. They claim fingerprints in masses. They claim signatures on 16 papers by people who may not be able to write. And if they can't sign, they have to remain in custody, etc. Now, <clears throat> I think this is another reason for us to start, as soon as we can, really to examine the basis of this primitive but very substantial nationalism of the underdeveloped countries. We are delighted to have our guests participate as much as they can in our discussion, so I'm very glad that Dr. Fred Berg came to talk to us. Dr. Heilprin? Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to use uh, George Duncan's phrase, I would like to submit to you two platitudes hmm. separated by a heresy. <laughs> uh, the first platitude is uh, that we are all of us underdeveloped countries. Uh, we have underdeveloped countries of the West, we have underdeveloped countries of the so-called recent settlement, to use Norx's phrase. We have the primitive underdeveloped countries say, of Africa, and we mm. have the ancient but uh, stationary civilizations of Asia. But we do have, and this is the platitude that I want to submit, the underdeveloped countries of the West, who have become underdeveloped because of the relentless and extremely rapid progress of technology, and whose demand on capital is very large indeed, and has to be satisfied if they too are not to slide back behind what they can be. And one of the great problems for the so-called underdeveloped countries is a very great demand for capital on the part of the advanced countries themselves. Now as to the heresy. Uh, contrary to what uh, Monsieur Rouvier said this morning, and with which I agree, uh, colonialism, far from having interfered with the economic advance of outlying part of the world has actually made some development conscious. <coughs> At uh, my institute in Geneva, I never thought to tell my students that there would have been no concern over economic development in Asia or Africa had it not been for colonialism. 
Colonialism has sent out the germs of economic growth, the concern of a growing living standard, the idea that poverty is not inevitable throughout the world, and it should deserve a great vote of thanks from all the underdeveloped countries, as well as a sigh of regret that it has come to an end. Now comes my third platitude, which may take a little longer to expand, not much longer. Uh, the third platitude is that economic growth is a homespun process that cannot be imported from outside. It can only be helped by foreign investment, by a foreign supply of capital, by a foreign supply of education, by a foreign supply of know-how. But it is essentially a domestic product of the underdeveloped countries. That is not often enough said. From this follows a corollary that it just is not enough. On this point, I have changed my mind in the last years. It just is not enough to do what we did in the International Chamber of Commerce when I was connected with it some years back, to write a code of fair treatment for foreign private capital or what Herman Ups has proposed to write a Magna Carta of the treatment of foreign investment, or what we heard this morning, to organize a club of decent debtors. All this is just not enough. Private capital is simply not going to go in large volume to countries which treat domestic capital formation badly. For a country to receive foreign capital, I suggest it is indispensable to favor domestic capital uh, formation. In other words, they must abandon, to use the Mises phrase, the anti-capitalist mentality in favor of a pro-capitalist mentality, and they will get foreign private capital as a corollary. Private uh, intergovernmental aid is not going to fill the gap indefinitely. To my mind, such as it is for political reasons, it is already too big to be stood by those who extend it, especially by the United States, and it will quite inevitably, in my opinion, dry up. So the only real source of capital will be private capital, and that will only go to countries which create a climate favorable to their own capital formation. Now, there are alternatives. I. Uh, wouldn't quite agree that economic development is only possible in a liberal society. It is entirely possible in a slave society. There is economic development in China, paid for by a utter destruction of all human values. It is also possible by inflation for a time which erodes society and paves the way for eventual uh, slave societies. But it is possible. And the alternative is private economic development in a liberal framework. What can we do to help it? It's my last remark, and that I will expand on more tomorrow. What we can do to help is to get the West together, to create a real Western pole of economic attraction based on free trade and convertible currencies, so that there will be really a point for it non the developed country to make a choice between its dirigisme and its participation in a growing network of freer tra private trade. So long as the West doesn't do that, it can buy some time, it can't buy time indefinitely. Thank you. Say one word. Oh, sure. I think it would help what we had from Just one word. Just to say it. Ich wollte nur in drei Worten sagen, ich stimme mit Herrn Halperin vollkommen überein, dass auch die innere eigene Kapitalbildung äh, eine Bedingung ist. Aber ich glaube, dass die beiden Dinge nicht nur sich ausschließen, sondern konvergieren und sich ergänzen. Und wenn die Bedingungen für das eine geschaffen wird, dann wird das das andere unterstützt und umgekehrt. I certainly agree with what Professor Halperin has just been saying. The two things
things do not only are not not incompatible with each other, but rather complement each other. Because you, if you do the one thing, then it stands to reason to expect that the other thing also is done. Uh, <laughs> Professor Stegler, did you ask for the floor? Well, I'm going to make one dark remark, although I believe. Well, come up here. While he's coming up here, I might note that if our time runs out, and if any of you would like to record your ideas on the tape recorder for inclusion in the uh, in a uh, uh, minutes of the meeting or in the record of the meeting for possible further or in the record of the meeting for possible further consultation or use, uh, that would be entirely possible to do. Well, the only remark I wish to make is one that I find personally very disquieting, and which has already been hinted at already by Mr. Uh, Kuhnert Ledeen and by Mr. Heilperin. I myself am not acquainted with any highly successful industrialization of any economy, except either by the method of colonization, as in the United States, Canada, and Australia, or by the method of coercion, as in Japan. And while I highly approve of all the lessons that we were told to give to the underdeveloped countries on the establishment of free presses and of a capitalistic climate, I am not at all clear that there is any basic historical evidence that this is the correct method of approaching the problem. <coughs> and indeed, from this viewpoint, I'd be inclined to argue that the Abandonment of colonization was perhaps the greatest error that the Western powers ha have ever made with respect to the underdeveloped countries. Uh, Dr. Navarro. I made these notes before Mr. Harper talks. I agree completely with him. Louder. Louder. Yes. I must confess, I am not expert in economics of the undeveloped countries. But really, I am an expert in living, in suffering, and in enjoying in one undeveloped country, because my love country, Mexico, is a peculiar example of a, of a undeveloped country. And for my fortune, I am living the life of the men who deal with the economic problems in one undeveloped country. Sometimes we get scared when too many people have too much interest in my undeveloped, undeveloped country. Because <laughs> when somebody wants to help us, that means the beginning of more our, of our troubles. <laughs> we begin to tremble when we read in our papers that our government gets money from the exterior because that very day, the things <laughs> begin to get worse. The government have more money to make better competition with the private in industry. They use that money to pay the first installment of the newest kind of nationalization the forced buying of foreign industries. I wanted to refer myself to the paper of Mr. Van Sico. That paper answered almost all the questions that can be done about the undeveloped countries. But I, I have little time and I want to say that the paper of Mr. Foster, that it is a living proof of the procedures that the Soviets are using to infiltrate among us in Latin America. We are going to publish that paper in our countries to warn our peoples about that kind of procedures. Some of them much bet in much better way for their purposes than all the things that the Western countries are, are doing in our undeveloped countries. The Montpellier Society must publish this, all the documents 
not only in, in those languages, but also in Spanish, in behalf of our 200 millions of people. Finally, I want to refer to a paper that has not been read here. It belongs to Mr. P.T. Bauer and its name, Whom Should We Add? I want to read one impressive paragraph only of that paper, even in English with my Russian accent. <laughs> More recently, it has been influentially proposed, especially in the United States, that the principal criterion of eligibility for aid should be the adoption by the recipient government of com comprehensive development planning and large-scale compulsory, compulsory saving, special tra taxation to accelerate capital formation. The acceptance of this criterion implies that not only should A increase the resources of the government relatively to the private sector, but it should be given to countries in which the direction and composition of economic activity are determined largely by the government. That's true, and the solution is given in this small oil paragraph. Thus, in the allocation of economic aid, preference, preference should be given to governments which try to undertake effectively a wide range of more or less clearly specified activities while refraining from intensive or close control of economic life. Such control, in fact, rarely conduces to economic advance and much less to the raising of the living standards of the people. It implies a society in which decision-making is centralized, in which individuals have little choice of, uh, of alternatives as producers or consumers, and which is vulnerable to totalitarian appeal. It will also seem rational to give preference to those countries which systematically encourage private capital formation by their own citizens and also the inflow of private foreign capital, thereby uh, eliminating the paradox that governments which restrict the entry and activity of external private capital receive heavy government economic aid. We can conclude with Professor Friedman that maybe the only conclusion is that the best help is not to give any help. The private initiative of each country can find by itself, like Professor Herpen says, the aid of the private capital of other countries if the investment climate is favorable. I was told just now from the people, some people of Spain, that in the Bank of Spain there are too much capital that cannot be used in the interior for the unfavorable ca capital uh, climate. Then we must, uh, we the undeveloped countries must begin to to believe in free enterprise before we get some foreign aid. Thank you very much. I hope our failure to provide a translator out of the Russian accent has not impeded the understanding of the very excellent comments of Mr. Navarro. Mr. John Davenport. That's a long road from that. <laughs> uh, I wanted just to uh, back up and second uh, the remarks of George Stiegler, uh, which seemed to me uh, most, Love most of, of George Stiegler, which seemed to me most pertinent, uh, that the entire attack on colonialism has probably done more harm than many other things in our time. And to point out two things that have contributed to this, 
which seems to be simply the misapplication of historical parallels. Uh, the first thing that we Americans in particular have done is to take the American Revolution as the starting point and to say that because we revolted from Britain successfully, leading on to development and leading on to individual freedom, therefore everyone can do it. Leaving out, of course, uh, the obvious platitudes, the common language, the inheritance of British law, and beyond that, the inheritance uh, going back to the Judean uh, Christian civilization. Now that has been one line leading on to this insistence by America of self-determination, leading on to the Wilsonian policy after World War I, of which it's sad to relate that scarcely one of the nations which we created at Versailles uh, now exist as independent nations, scarcely one. But this historical parallelism is now being used in a different way. Uh, that led us rather to back the Congo affair. Then Katanga wanted to get out of the Congo. Much to my amazement, just before I left New York, talking to some colleagues of mine, uh, I made the remark, well, uh, I hope we recognize Katanga. Seems to be the center, and self-determination at last might be a good principle. I know, he said, there's the principle of the American Civil War. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Where we did not allow General Lee, uh, following Lord Acton's advice, to get out. Now, I think when you put those two things together, you really come uh, just to the height of the ridiculous of applying both. Uh, one way we follow the American Revolution where it's to our convenience, the next time we s cite the Civil War, the things cancel. Uh, if there is any solution or synthesis, I suggest it would be in so far as we are able in trying to draw men's attention uh, not to the self-determination of nations, but to apply a different criteria. What leads to the self-determination of individuals. <laughs> and to gild the lily, that in some cases might lead to national self-determination, as in the US. In other cases, it might lead to the continuation of colonialism. In other cases, it might lead to a very mixed uh, system of forms that we cannot envisage. But let us focus on the individual and apply one further test which I think Professor Hayek has suggested in his book. How are the law courts? Are there courts of law? Are people just thrown into prison unjustly? That is a far better criteria than saying, ah, is the nation uh, free or not? Thank you. I have an urgent request and a high price offered for one minute uh, by Mr. Kunal Tlaibin. This is just one remark I forgot to say in the haste, and this is this that we must never forget in dealing with the vast majority of underdeveloped countries that these nations, nationalities, and tribes have an infinitely greater natural affinity towards all sorts of collectivism, including socialism, including communism, than we have just because they are more primitive. So in other words, and this is the enormous strength of communist propaganda, even if they, even if in the picture of communism you tell them there would be forced labor because forced labor is something which due to the history of institutions they are used to. But personality is not as much developed as with us and therefore not a sense of private property. And therefore the probable avenue which I would advance is in trying to export our own ideas to find those dynamic personalities which you even find, as a matter of fact, in darkest Africa 
uh, who probably are considered to be rather egotistic and rather emancipated from their tribal and family connections, and cooperate with them and then look for a slow transformation of a mind and mentality. But we should never forget sight of one thing. We are handicapped. The others have the advance because they are appealing to the more primitive, because they operate with a false idée claire. Whereas the true liberal idea is one of a very high abstraction and of a very high complex nature and not of that fantastic deluding simplicity which socialism has. Thank you. Mr. Shaw would like to make a very brief comment. You can do it at the end. I notice that each speaker who comes up is impelled to allude to the fear which is closest to his own heart and personal experience. And I have one fear which has not been alluded to. The headlong corruption of terminology, expertly engineered and advanced by the Communist Party apparatus, has already cost us the original meaning of two such important words as democracy and colonialism. Endless illustrations could be added. I have the feeling that in this decade, the West will be confronted by a grave crisis or crises, not only economic, political, diplomatic, but also semantic. <laughs> We have one minute left for anybody who prizes it highly. <laughs> Mister? Mister? Look at this label. I am also. Show the label. A guest. Yes. Mr. Zulaga. From no, Venezuela. Zulaga. From Zulaga Venezuela. from Venezuela. I believe that this session of today has been very important for us that become from uh, the underdeveloped countries. I would call my country a much highly underdeveloped than Mexico to, to Navarro's country. I just wanted to put to you, scholars and professors of economics, a question about the help to underdeveloped countries. Are the Western countries really helping the underdeveloped countries' citizens, individuals, or are they helping the definite pro-socialist <coughs> governments of those countries to become even more powerful against the free enterprise? In my country today, private capital is running away. Private capital, local and foreign, is going away because of fear of socialism, is going away because of interventionism. And at the same time, a lot of help is being offered to my country's government by the International Congress. I think we are all delighted to have these further examples of the distinction between the development of countries and of people. I'm sorry to have to call this interesting session to a close. Uh, Dr. Hunold informs me that the buses for the trip this afternoon will leave the Schloss Hotel at 2.30, uh, promptly at 2.30. Is there, there's no other announcement? No. This meeting is therefore adjourned.